So I, I want to um, uh, talk about uh, why this was such a pivotal uh, election and, uh, and why I decided to uh, undertake a, a sequel, which was um, kind of tough because I basically couldn't write this book until after the election. If Romney had won, uh, it would have been uh, really hard to uh, <laughs> stick for a lot of reasons, but it would have been really hard to, you know, I would have had to write a very different kind of book with a different tone. And, and uh, um, so while I was doing research over the last couple of years, I really wrote this in the last six months, uh, and it just came out last week. I just found, and I don't want this to sound boastful, but I believe in transparency about if I'm feeling good and looking like I'm in a good mood, it's because about 15 minutes ago, I found out that I made the bestseller list in Sunday's New York Times. Um, so, uh, anyway, that's just a little piece of personal egotism that I probably shouldn't have dropped in there, but when you're an author and you're out on book tour, these things are important. Um, so, but before I explain why I think this election was so uh, pivotal, I want to um, tell you a, a story uh, about how, in some ways, um, Obama's victory began. And it's a story that is not about Barack Obama. Um, it was uh, a pitch black night in the Florida Everglades in 2005, and a car uh, driven by a woman went off the road and into a canal and sunk to the bottom of the canal. And a man uh, working at a motorcycle dealership nearby heard the passerbys yelling that there'd been an accident. And he sprinted to the scene where a, um, a, a passerby had tried, dove in, tried to get the door open and broken his arm. And by the time the, uh, the man reached the scene, that Good Samaritan and the others were saying, she's gone, dude, she's gone. And uh, the man uh, jumped in anyway and tried to get the door open. He was finally able to get the door open, but she was trapped by her seatbelt. And uh, he, somebody else on the canal bank had a, a knife in, in his truck, and so the man dove in again, and he cut the seatbelt, and he freed, freed the woman and she came to the surface where she was revived. Uh, the EMT people were not there yet. Um, and then they said, baby seat, baby seat, the crowd yelled. And the man dove in a third time uh, in the pitch black and he's feeling um, uh, for a baby in the, in the back of the, uh, of the car um, because a baby seat had floated to the surface. Fortunately, there was no baby. The woman survived and um, the man was, um, decorated as a hero by Davy, the Florida, the, the town nearby, and by an insurance company. Um, and the man's name was Scott Prudy. And uh, six years later, uh, seven years later, he was working as a bartender in Boca Raton, Florida, for a catering company. Um, and he um, made a decision um, to turn on a Canon camera that he had bought, brought to the event and record Mitt Romney's comments at this fundraiser. Um, and then for, for two weeks, he didn't look at this 68 minute tape. I spent a lot of time with Scott. Uh, and um, one night uh, he knows that He'll probably have to lose his job. As he said later, maybe he would end up in the Everglades. Uh, and he goes into the bathroom and he looks in the mirror and he says, you are an effing coward to himself. And the next day he starts to release little bits of this video and he adopts um, the identity of a young Chinese work, factory worker. He takes the cover of a book called Factory Girl by Leslie Chang. He's a 38-year-old beefy white guy uh, right in the heart of the Romney demographic. Um, 
and he adopts uh, the identity of a young Chinese woman. He takes the, uh, the name Anne, A-N-N-E, Anonymous 670, and he begins to, to post because what really offended him was not just the 47% comment that Mitt Romney made, but um, what Romney said about favorably about Chinese sweatshops. Uh, and it, it uh, pierced his conscience, and he took action. And I got very interested in his um, motivation. And he finally said to me, you know, back on the canal bank, afterward I said to myself, if you can jump in, you must jump in. And he felt like this was another one of those situations where he was being called to take action to, in what he considered to be a good cause, which was to prevent Mitt Romney from becoming president of the United States. Um, and um, it's very hard to assess. There's so many variables. No single variable led to the reelection of the president. Um, but after this incident and after the full tape was released to Mother Jones magazine in September of 2012, the fundraiser had been in, in May, um, uh, Obama opened up a seven-point lead in the polls. Then on October 3rd in Denver, as you all remember, and I have a whole chapter on the first debate, uh, he blew it and he had a by all accounts, a poor performance, which we can talk about if you want. Um, and uh, it was my sense that if he hadn't had that cushion from the 47% incident, uh, he may well have slipped behind after that first debate, and it could have been very hard for him to catch up. The whole dynamic of the race would have changed if Romney had actually gone into the lead after the first debate. Uh, much harder to catch up at that point as Romney found. Um, so um, I think that was an important event, but it also, for me, setting aside the horse race, um, the attitude toward the 47%, the attitude that Mitt Romney displayed on that famous videotape, highlighted one of the major themes of the year, which was an argument that the Republicans were essentially making that we're a nation of makers versus takers. Some people do all the work, other people take it all. Now when the takers, the takers or the moochers uh, heard this, they um, rebelled, I guess you could say. Um, it wasn't the first time that this issue had come up. Class politics really go back to the 1896 election uh, between William Jennings Bryan, who was nominated here in Chicago, and William McKinley, whose campaign manager, Mark Hanna, Carl Rove's self-described role model and, and hero, once said, uh, there are two things important in politics, money, and I can't remember what the second thing is. Uh, and so this was a class-based campaign. Uh, and, and actually, Scott Prudy, the bartender, saw what he did in, through a class consciousness. Uh, he had gone down to the Galapagos and um, uh, uh, very interested in animals, uh, works for the ASPCA in Florida. And he had thought about not just Darwinism, but social Darwinism. What does that mean, survival of the fittest in society? Um, and the makers versus takers theme, more recently, I came upon a ad from the 1972 campaign, 40 years ago. It was an ad for a group called Democrats for Nixon, which was pretty big that year. And it had a man sitting on a, a construction worker sitting on a beam and eating his lunch, a hard hat, they called it then, as some of you might remember. And the announcer says, Senator George McGovern wants to make 47% of Americans eligible for welfare, paid by people like you. That's right, 
47 percent. Uh, now, it turned out that the real 47 percent in this election was the percentage of Romney supporters. Obama won 53-47. Uh, he was the first president in half a century since Dwight Eisenhower, who won two elections with a majority. Uh, first Democrat since Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt. Um, so um, I wanted to know how. I sensed early on um, in, in after the 2010 midterms, which is when the book begins, uh, that this would be a pivotal presidential election. Now, normally what they call re-elects are not. Um, uh, for, this is the ninth presidential election I covered, and I'm embarrassed to admit, it's kind of masochistic of me, but uh, every four years, one of the candidates says, this is the most important election of my lifetime, and because he's running, right? So of course it's gonna be the most important election. Um, this time, I think it was. Um, and the reason is that because of this makers versus takers frame, uh, the whole social contract dating back to Franklin Roosevelt was on the line. Now when Nixon, using the politics of resentment, when he brought up the 47%, he was just trying to clobber McGovern with it. He had actually favored what they called the negative income tax, which is the proposal he was attacking McGovern for just two years earlier in the White House. And he, um, like Eisenhower, you know, believed in infrastructure investments in, in all of the New Deal programs. He didn't bother to challenge any of them, um, not to mention that the EPA, which all the Republican candidates the last time won, this, this time wanted to abolish, was established under Nixon. OSHA, which they'd also like to abolish, established under Nixon. So there had been this post-war consensus that went from Roosevelt all the way through Clinton um, that we were going to accept these progressive accomplishments of the 20th, 20th century and the social contract. Then came a new crowd kind of building on what Newt Gingrich started in 1994. And this was not your father's Republican Party that won in 2010. And so when I saw the results of the 2010 midterms, it made me realize that we were teeing up a historic choice election about two very different directions for the country. And I didn't know how true that would be. Because at the beginning of the process, you might think, all right, well, Mitt Romney was governor of Massachusetts. You know, he's the likely nominee. He did some kind of moderate things there. He did, you know, an early version of Obamacare there. Um, but he was the head of a party that had decided on a strategy uh, that could only be described as radical. Uh, right after the 2010 midterms, um, John Boehner went on 60 Minutes and uh, he said that they didn't believe in compromise. Uh, he didn't like that word, it wasn't po popular with the, the Tea Party, which was uh, very big at that point. Um, well, compromise is what the nation was founded on. I mean, everything about our founding was connected to compromise. Compromise is the only way you prevent war. Compromise is the only way you ever get anything done. And suddenly you had a, a whole, a, a chamber of, uh, 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 of Congress, the House, which was in the hands of people who, even if Boehner might have been game for compromise, his caucus was not. Uh, so it, it created an intense period of um, obstruction and uh, uh, gridlock that led to what I call the low point of the Obama presidency after the debt ceiling uh, fiasco. So, um, but that was all set against um, other things that were happening that I don't think were very well chronicled, unfortunately, during the, the campaign. Um, because the Republicans won uh, so many state legislatures in 2010, aside from winning the House, 
they were able not just to draw new district lines that will give them, likely give them control of the House until the next census, uh, in 2020. Um, they happen to have the good fortune to win in a census year. They also embarked on something that I call the voter suppression project, a concerted, often coordinated effort in 19 states that passed legislation uh, that uh, if that legislation had stood, um, it would have been almost impossible for Barack Obama to get reelected uh, because each of those laws was targeted at discouraging different democratic constituency groups from voting. So I try to tell that story. Uh, the economy in 2010, close to 10% unemployment, if that had continued, uh, it would have been very hard for the president to be reelected. Even by November of 2011, Nate Silver, who became later became the security blanket for, for liberals, in the New York Times wrote a cover story in the New York Times magazine saying, is Obama toast? That was one year before he was reelected. So a lot of times now you hear, well, you know, he was always going to win. The Republicans were so weak. Not clear at all at the time. Um, so um, I wanted um, to get a sense of how this president that I had followed closely, I first met him at my, uh, when my uh, cousins were sitting Shiva for my aunt on the north side in 2000 and, uh, late 2001 and early, maybe it was early 2002, he had just lost for the House, and he was telling me that he was going to run for the Senate. And I thought, well, that's some real chutzpah this guy had. <laughs> uh, um, but I wanted to know how this enormously confident man who had achieved a lot in his first two years as president, how he was going to fight back and find his uh, voice that he seemed to have lost. Uh, and I try to explain how he lost that voice, how he wasn't such a great communicator in 2010 and 2011. Uh, why did that happen on Obamacare that he couldn't convey it? Um, what is it about his, his emotional makeup that uh, hampered him? Uh, I say that he's missing the schmooze gene, that there's some, he can, when he appeared here, or when you, many of you who, who know him know that he, he's capable of turning it on and being extraordinarily charming when he wants to. Uh, but the great paradox about the man is that somebody who achieved something politically, winning twice with a majority for the first time in half a century, the supreme political accomplishment in our country, could be somebody who really isn't a politician at heart and who has a kind of a disdain not just for uh, backslapping but the the theater of politics the presidency is a theater and uh, part of what happened to him in that first debate and that has, has hurt him a little bit in some other situations is that he doesn't fully grasp um, I think he does now more fully grasp that he has to embrace the cosmetic, artificial, phony parts of the job that are not necessarily very relevant, as he would say, to the job of being president, but that were essential to him getting reelected. And he was able to do that um, and develop, after some, some struggling with it, develop a coherent message on the middle class that carried him forward. Um, but I think even that would not have been enough if he hadn't built, down at the Prudential Building, the most sophisticated political organization in American history, and also the largest, with eventually two million volunteers, and the first digital campaign uh, of the 21st century. So Franklin Roosevelt mastered radio, John F. Kennedy mastered television, Barack Obama, uh, master digital technology, not just the internet, but other, other tools. Um, uh, 
big data tools and, and others that I, uh, I can tell you a little bit about um, in ways that made a huge difference. So I have a chapter, for instance, called The Cave. I don't know if all of you by this point know about The Cave. Um, I didn't know about it until after the election. It was a secret annex uh, in the Prudential Building off of the main floor where some of you, if you were volunteers or new people who worked at the Obama campaign, you probably saw that huge open floor plan that they had uh, in their campaign this time. Um, this was uh, in an unmarked room down the hall and nobody from outside the campaign was allowed into the cave. Uh, Eric Schmidt, the head of Google, was the only one there and he's now hired to create a new company, uh, the 28-year-old head of the cave and um, uh, several others from there uh, to try to teach business uh, things that were pioneered in politics. This is a huge change. Traditionally, you know, Madison Avenue values start in business, then they go into politics. It's never before gone the other way. So what did these guys, these, these analytics geeks do? Um, they developed a series of tools and products, and I do it in detail, translated from the original geek into English in the book, uh, a series of tools and products um, that uh, have in some ways uh, revolutionized politics um, by allowing canvassers in Ohio, for instance, instead of going to every, every uh, house on the street, they just go to the houses where Mrs. Jones you know, hasn't turned in her absentee ballot, Mr. Smith needs a ride to the polls, and they could micro-target on them. So in some ways, it was revolutionizing politics. In other ways, it was a return to a kind of politics that those of you who've been around for a while will remember if you grew up in Chicago. So that chapter I call the New Chicago Machine. And um, so uh, what, and the president's late father-in-law, Michelle Obama's father, Fraser Robinson, was a precinct captain on the south side. So what did the old machine do? Um, there were precinct captains who uh, made sure that they knew the voters in their precincts. Uh, sometimes they might, you know, if somebody was sick, maybe they'd bring them some food. More often they would be there to get the curb fixed because they had clout downtown. Uh, they often were city employees like, like Michelle Obama's father, um, so there were jobs uh, that were connected to it through the patronage system. The patronage part of it was not reproduced by Obama, but what OFA did in this campaign was to reproduce in a new way, fueled by technology, the face-to-face, friend-to-friend, neighbor-to-neighbor contact that used to be at the heart of American politics. So this campaign was described to me as a, uh, uh, a, a ward campaign. Uh, Jim Messina, the campaign manager, said, or a governor's race on steroids. Uh, and after 30 or 40 years of uh, voters just being um, members of demographic groups or gross ratings points uh, as targets for ads, there were plenty of TV ads, which the cave and the analytics folks figured out how to make more efficient. But the really interesting part was the reassembling of this face-to-face -face contact between volunteers and voters in battleground states, in a limited number of states. Uh, and it fascinated me and it made the difference. And now all the Republicans recognize this. Um, uh, so Mitch McConnell, who's never had a nice thing to say, even before he said his priority his first priority was not serving the people of Kentucky, not serving the people of the United States, but getting rid of Barack Obama, you remember that? Even he, this week, said he wanted to learn from the Obama campaign so that he could um, get himself reelected. Uh, 
So I think people know that, um, know that Obama had this advantage in digital technology. And I tell the story of how Romney completely fumbled the ball, a self-described numbers guy, uh, couldn't refuse to hire uh, analytics uh, geeks when he was offered the opportunity. Um, people know that this was the case. I try to explain how. How did this happen? Uh, and and uh, inside the cave, they had not just data scientists, but um, biophysicists, uh, a child prodigy, three professional poker players. These were very unusual, mostly very young people who re-engineered re politics, but in a way that allowed Jeremy Bird and the field organization uh, to deliver on, on the ground. And so that, what David Axelrod described as that melding of technology and shoe leather, uh, I just found fascinating um, and wanted to make sure that uh, uh, people understood moving forward how this could change uh, all of politics. But you still needed the passion. And one of the great surprises was that uh, the, the so-called enthusiasm gap that we all read about a lot in 2011 did not end up being the case. There were a number of different reasons for that. Um, the president himself had worried about it. He said the first time in 2008 was like being on a hot date. 2012 was like we got two kids and a mortgage, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, in the case of the U.S. budget deficit, a very, very large mortgage. Um, so he realized it was going to be a lot tougher and that they were going to have to compensate with all these different uh, strategies. And it, it, he went back to his roots, basically, as a community organizer. This was an astonishingly well-organized campaign. And the reason that he was crying down at the Prudential Building on the day after the election is that he realized that these kids had done it. He said, you are better than we were which as somebody about Obama's age I could relate to. Um, baby boomers were much more self-absorbed and, and uh, uh, let just less good at, at figuring out how to uh, be mo you know, moderate in their, in their approach and uh, in ways that didn't turn off a lot of people. Uh, and so he was constantly impressed by how much better, he said this over and over again, uh, to uh, Marty Nesbitt, you know, his best friend uh, from Chicago, and, um, as he traveled around the country. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to try to address a little bit also um, the consequences for now, because I think they're being misunderstood. Uh, there's a, he's had a bad month. He's beset by these, all these stories. Uh, he hasn't done a good enough job getting ahead of them. But I think there's also a kind of a, uh, what I would describe as an almost a, a PTSD effect going on with uh, a lot of people in the progressive movement um, where they, they, they haven't quite processed that he won the election. You know? <laughs> and none some none of their fears are going to come true. They can yell all they want on cable, to, on Fox News, the Ryan plan, repealing Obamacare. None of this is going to happen. It's all a fantasy. It went from being a, a threat, and if you look at the Ryan plan, it does repeal the American social contract, as Ryan himself said. Uh, um, you know, he's a disciple of Ayn Rand, and uh, he, and I, I explain in the book that this is not just a, you know, a charge. Um, he uh, considers her to be his greatest influence in, in public life. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence for that. Um, and he described, when the Ryan plan passed the House, he described it as rolling back the American social contract, rolling back uh, what we had agreed on since, since the New Deal. And this is what the president thought the stakes were. Um, so the reason he doesn't seem to be sweating too much about all of this is not just because these 
scandals and so-called scandals don't extend into the White House. Um, it's because he knows he has the veto pen until 2017. Uh, and he's always looking to the longer term. His greatest interest is to be remembered for something more than being the first African-American president, to put points on the board, to use the basketball metaphors that he favors, um, beyond what he did in his first two years. Um, and he, um, I think he understood the stakes and believed even more strongly than I did, not just because he was running, that if he had lost, um, not only would everything he, have, he had done have been reversed, but a lot that his Democratic, and in some cases Republican predecessors had done, was reversed. You remember during the primaries, got only one chapter on the Republican primaries, it's called the clown car, which was a, <laughs> which was a, a line that came from a Republican conservative columnist about the Republican candidates. You remember when Rick Perry had a brain freeze and he, he couldn't, he wanted to abolish uh, it's either three or four um, federal departments and he couldn't remember which ones. And this was, this was, and I have a scene uh, where earlier they think he, he's high on medication. He's at a reception at a the debate's held at a college in Michigan, and he's at a reception, and I have these first-hand accounts of people thinking that he was, you know, out of, out of his mind high because he just had spinal surgery and uh, was on medication, which is people denied. But he clearly was a little off his game, which wasn't so great in the first place. But uh, um, So everybody focused on this gaffe, and it was. It was probably the biggest gaffe. Uh, in, uh, in the history of debates uh, since uh, Chicago and Newt Minow basically invented modern uh, presidential debates in 1960. Um, but what almost nobody talked about is here's a guy who's a very serious candidate for president and he wants to abolish four departments of government and that the other candidates, including Romney, all said, yes, 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 get rid of the EPA, Department of Energy, Department of Education, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. What was the fourth? Oh, commerce, yeah, commerce, that was the fourth one. Uh, this is a radical idea. So in this, and there were a lot more like them. In this election, it was the Republicans who were the radicals, and Obama who was the small c conservative. He was trying to conserve, defend, protect these accomplishments of the 20th century. So I didn't want to write just another campaign book. Yes, I pull back the curtain. I give people a lot of the stories that happened, uh, uh, not just you know, not just behind closed doors in debate prep, where Obama was 0 for 6, interestingly, against John Kerry playing Mitt Romney, and not just in the Situation Room during uh, 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 the uh, effort to get Bin Laden, which I devote a chapter to. I want to do all of that pull back the curtain, but also put it in a historical framework and explain to people that this was what I call a hinge of history. And uh, I think the best way to understand that and why I called the book The Center Holds is to think about it, a little thought experiment, think about where we would be right now if Romney and Ryan had won the election which they expected to do. Uh, Romney didn't even write a concession speech. He was so sure that he was going to win. And Paul Ryan, on the night before the election, uh, told his aides the only thing he was concerned about, the only thing he was talking about, was would he have to resign his seat if, uh, in the House if he became vice, when he became vice president-elect. That was his only concern the night before the election. And that's because of, of, of uh, the way they messed up their polling and all kinds of other things that I explain in the book. Um, so if they had won, think about it for a minute, the economy is moving up. What would everybody be saying right now? They'd go, well, Barack Obama, he's Jimmy Carter. You know, and when we got a business-friendly president in there, of course the economy went up. 
and there would be a cause and effect. Well, we slash taxes for the wealthy, we slashed regulation, we slashed the programs for the poor, we got most of the Ryan plan through, which they would have for reasons I can explain. Uh, and of course the economy is going up. For a generation, progressive ideas would have been thoroughly discredited and this would have been the way that everybody assumed economic growth was created, was the Republican agenda. Uh, so um, when people are there's a certain amount of Obama fatigue right now, you could argue. People are annoyed at him in some cases uh, for good reason. I'm quite upset, at, not just as a reporter, but a citizen about uh, efforts to criminalize reporting, um, which the president himself is saying he's troubled by now in the case of the AP and, and a Fox News reporter. Um, other people are more concerned about the IRS scandal and whatever else he's facing now. Um, it pales in comparison to where we would be in the country, I believe, if we had, if we were in the middle of a sharp rightward shift. And I would argue that unless there's some big foreign policy crisis in, in Turkey or Syria or Iran, that what will be remembered from 2013 is not these scandals of the spring, but the fate of the immigration bill, which is uh, coming to the floor of the, of the Senate this month. Um, that's, what, that's the kind of thing that presidents are remembered for. Uh, and the reason that there is hope, I think a lot of confidence that there will be an immigration bill goes back to the campaign. Obama got 71% of Latinos, and any Republican with half a brain knows that they must, they must bring that margin down or they have no future as a political party, uh, given the demographic trends in the country. So um, what this campaign in Chicago was doing and the way they reached out in almost a subterranean parallel campaign to Latinos with the Latina Oprah and uh, going to um, soccer matches and uh, naturalization ceremonies and all kinds of things under the radar that were going on to run up their margin with Latinos when they were losing, particularly with white males, but with whites generally, uh, is so connected not just to Obama's victory but to what will happen now. And that's why elections uh, have not just immediate consequences, but enduring, enduring consequences, not just if you're Latino and, and, and want to have a path to citizenship, but for anybody who, who understands that it's the big things, Obamacare, immigration reform, uh, whether we're going to get a, a, an infrastructure jobs bill that can start to rebuild this country, which is something that the Republican Party was founded on in the 1850s. Infrastructure, internal improvements, uh, was very much right there with sla opposition to slavery in the territories. Founding idea of the Republican Party now rejected. Whether they can get back to that and we can move on to solve you know, the real problems as opposed to the phony cable news of the country. Um, and I think the, um, uh, the president um, is very um, confident and unruffled by this. And I got interested in, in his nature in my last book and can, his temperament and continue it uh, in this. Uh, and I just wanted to um, tell you a, a, a quick story about his sang Freud and how much he enjoys um, watching when people strike back on his behalf against critics in ways that he could not himself do. So my wife um, is a producer of the Colbert Report and when people hear that they go, well why do we want to listen to this guy? Where, where, where is she? <laughs> um, and um, today she was with Paul McCartney who was on the show tonight. Um, and um, some of you might remember 
a uh, offer that Donald Trump, who was suffering from what I call in a chapter uh, Obama derangement syndrome, <laughs> made an offer to the president that he would give $3 million uh, to a charity of his choice if he released his college transcripts, uh, assuming, I guess Trump assumed that he was stupid or something, I don't know what he thought, his birth certificate, which he'd already released the year before and so forth. Uh, so when Colbert heard this, he said, um, well, I am making an offer of a million dollars to Donald Trump and a million dollars, Mr. Trump, if you allow me to dip my balls in your mouth so that nothing else comes out of it. <laughs> and so then flash forward to after the election, after the election, Kennedy Center honors Stephen Colbert is introducing David Letterman and he goes through the receiving line with his wife, Evie, and uh, he says, congratulations, Mr. President, on your reelection. And the president says, well, thank you, Stephen. Uh, I got some help from the Colbert Super PAC. Uh, a better tomorrow tomorrow, I think was their slogan. Um, and Stephen said, well, we, we, can't, we can't talk about that. That would be coordinating. Uh, and uh, Obama says, we can't talk about that, but we can talk about your offer to Donald Trump. <laughs> and at that moment, Michelle Obama comes over and she says, we watched that video over and over and over again. So, and I've got a picture in the book of, uh, of, of Obama and, and Colbert. Um, uh, so uh, I just want to leave you with that, that uh, even when he's in trouble, the president enjoys it, um, and I think he's re-energized and in some ways uh, liberated by having been uh, re-elected. So as bad as it gets, don't count this man, this Chicagoan, out. Thank you very much. So we have time for, how much time do we have? We've got about 10, a little more than 10 minutes for questions. There's a question upstairs on a stand, and I'll do my best down here to get to whoever I see with their hand up first. Right up here in front. I, I, do I have it? Okay. Um, is, do we have a hope for a fun, functioning legislative process any time in the near future? Do we have a hope for a functioning legislative process any time in the near future? Um, yes. Uh, look, the, the Senate just voted uh, 85 to 15 to allow the immigration bill to be debated. Only 15 senators, all Republicans, um, you know, were trying to obstruct. So does that mean that an immigration bill will be signed into law this year? Not necessarily. Uh, but it's never easy. I mean, even when Lyndon Johnson had overwhelming uh, filibuster, excuse me, filibuster-proof Democratic majorities in the 60s. It was always hard. Legislation's hard. But yes, on, on that bill and on many smaller bills that don't get very much attention, there will be cooperation. Will they have a grand bargain on the budget? No. Is that probably a good thing uh, that they don't? I would say yes, because I think austerity economics has now been discredited, uh, not just here but in Europe. Um, uh, will, will they necessarily, you know, move forward on, on things like uh, Obama's ideas of uh, funding early childhood education? Probably not. Um, but uh, they're also not going to do anything bad. Um, and presidents in second terms generally focus more on foreign affairs anyway. Um, so I think this was, a, a, despite the gridlock, um, I think that this was a, uh, and that will continue. Um, the lesson of the election is that we are basically a centrist country. And that, I talked about George McGovern, when he had his coalition of uh, women, young people, blacks, Latinos, gays, he carried 
one state, Massachusetts. Now, that's a majority, uh, and twice. And when people in uh, red states talk about, as they often do, you know, we're the real America, the heartland. No, Iowa, Illinois, Ohio, Michigan, that's the heartland of America. Those are blue states. So the question in terms of obstruction and, and Congress is when will Congress catch up to where the country is? And that's a function of um, how clever um, Democrats can be uh, in, uh, in closing that gap on something like, say, background checks. 90% support it on guns, and, and yet it failed in the Senate. Uh, but once you have the public on your side, it's a lot easier over time, not right away, but over time, to bring pressure to bear on the politicians to get right with their constituents. And that's what's going to end gridlock. And I do think that the president is committed to that outside game. By his own account, what he, he told me a couple of years ago is he was playing too much inside baseball. And now he's going to be out in the rest of the country more often. Next, yes, all the way back there. What happened to the Reagan oh, the Democrats? Duncan. To the Reagan Democrats? Uh, really interesting. Um, a lot of the Reagan Democrats uh, became Republicans, um, but there were also uh, quite a number in the uh, particularly uh, labor union members who voted for Reagan in, in 80 and 84 who came back to the Democrats uh, because they saw you know, Romney is the poster child for the 1%, uh, you know, not on their side, not connecting to them uh, as, as working people the way um, Ronald Reagan had. So um, the Reagan Democrats are now um, very much uh, uh, up for grabs, and uh, uh, enough of them have returned to the Democratic Party uh, to help Obama win a state like Ohio, um, which which was uh, full of Reagan Democrats. Yeah. Yes. Good. Good point. Well, it's, it's not all the same people, um, but the question is, you know, why didn't I talk more about enemies? It's because this is my first stump speech. My book tour just started, so <laughs> next, next time, if you come the next time, I'll talk more about the enemies. And, uh, you know, I have a lot. I have, I'm in a feud right now with Roger Ailes, who's attacking what I wrote about him in the book, uh, in the chapter Fox, Fox Nation. Uh, and um, I have a chapter about these super PAC billionaires like Sheldon Adelson uh, gave a hundred million dollars to the Republicans, one man. Um, they were not really there for Clinton. Clinton had enemies and the idea that Obama is you know, unique in having these enemies is wrong. People call Clinton a murderer. They called Eisenhower a communist. They called Lincoln a baboon. Uh, they, uh, they called Roosevelt a Jew, which was a pretty serious insult in the 1930s. Um, you know, so this, this kind of smash mouth politics has been around for a while. I try to trace how it came back, and, and I, have, I have a lot about uh, people like um, uh, not just Newt Gingrich, but Grover Norquist, um, who developed a, a stranglehold on our, on our political process with um, the, uh, you know, the, the tax, the anti-tax pledge. As it happened, I went to college with Grover and I, I interviewed him a lot and so I really try to take the reader inside how did he do that? How did we get to a situation where for a while in 2011, Grover Norquist, who believes in making the government small enough so that it can be drowned in a bathtub, is his quote, how did he get so much power in our, in our process? Uh, and then, as I mentioned, the, you know, the crazies, Obama derangement syndrome. And just to tell you a quick story on that, um, uh, 
One day in 2011, John Boehner went on Meet the Press and was asked whether he believed the president was born in this country. And indeed, George Stephanopoulos brought it up with the president himself. And at that point, Obama said, enough. Even though this Trump birther stuff is good for me politically because it's making the other side look so bad, I'm going to end it. So he was home in Kenwood, and he rummaged through his mother's uh, late mother's possessions, and he found the short form birth certificate, which he knew wouldn't sa satisfy anybody. So he sent his lawyer to Hawaii and, and got the government there to give him this long form birth certificate, uh, which he presented pretty angrily to the press and said, you know, enough of this nonsense. This is just silly. Uh, of course, that didn't entirely end it, but um, it, it tamped it down. Uh, and, uh, but even, even as angry as he was, he always uh, knew that the other side was overreaching and he could maybe exploit it. And even though he doesn't really like politics that much, he's obviously very skillful at playing political angles. So um, you remember the online store that the Obama campaign had? You know, memorabilia, t-shirts, all kinds of stuff sold and raised a fair amount of money with. Uh, they decided to uh, put the birth certificate on t-shirts and other things on the online store. And one day the president called somebody in and said, where are the mugs? I want my mugs. Uh, so he, he knew that he could get some people like, uh, like some of you to, uh, to help him fight the other side. Uh, and I, I ended up feeling that his enemies were their own worst enemy uh, for reasons that I explained in the book. There was this huge backlash against the voter suppression that I mentioned, and uh, African Americans actually voted in greater numbers in 2012 than in 2008 in a battleground state like Ohio. Because as Al Sharpton told me, blacks vote for two reasons out of hope and anger, and we voted out of hope in 2008 and out of anger in 2012. So that was something that the enemies brought on themselves. I think we have time for a couple we'll more. We'll take the next question up yes. in the balcony. Could you comment on fellow Chicago and Penny Pritzker becoming a civil servant? <laughs> so Penny Pritzker, who is now on track to be confirmed as Secretary of Commerce, uh, was uh, Obama's first um, big, big time supporter um, for the Senate. And it was, it was very important for him to get her on his side. I have a scene in my earlier book, In the Promise, where um, uh, she was possibly going to be up for Secretary of Commerce in 2009 in the first, first term. And the president had to call her up and tell her he was not going to nominate her and that he didn't think it was good for either one of them for him to put his no her nomination forward, that it would be a distraction uh, because of some of the scrutiny of um, her business dealings that the Democrats would have brought more scrutiny to than the Republicans are, are more supportive of her, interestingly, than a lot of people expected. Um, but there were a variety of reasons why her nomination didn't go forward then. And I, I thought it was interesting that he gave her the bad news directly. Usually presidents have underlings do that, um, but their relationship is so strong that um, he did it directly. It's very important, I think, that she be in. I, I spend a fair amount of time in the book explaining how the president's relations with the business community deteriorated. This was a big problem in his first term, uh, as he really did not have people close to him in the White House or, or at Commerce who had run a, run a big business. And he kept pointing to Valerie Jarrett, but she was uh, only uh, CEO of, of Habitat, the Chicago uh, real estate company that was built by Dan Levin and ch still chair of the board. And she was only head of that for a few months before the Obama campaign started in, in 2007. Uh, and so Penny Pritzker represents a, a heavy hitter, as they say, uh, who can really bring the business perspective um, into the uh, center of the government. It's something that Obama should have done a long time ago, if not with Penny Pritzker, then with somebody else. 
Uh, one more question up front. Oh, I'm sorry. Just one more okay. quick question. Great. I'm sorry I'm being long-winded in my answers. Um, also, there is a book signing after the program. Um, if you have your books, please remain in your seats and we'll call you up by row. Um, if you need to purchase books, uh, you can come back in and take a seat and we'll call you up. Can you elaborate on why Mitt Romney passed on the opportunity to assemble an analytic team the way the yeah, president? Yeah, I'll just tell you, I'll just tell you a quick, quick story. Um, um, so uh, there's a man named Alex Gage who is a longtime Republican operative and survey research expert who actually invented the term micro-targeting. He took it from laser surgery in the, in the medical area and about 15 years ago he started using it in politics. His wife, Carrie Packer Gage, was the deputy campaign manager of the Romney campaign. And so in early 2011, he saw that Obama was advertising for data scientists to move to Chicago. Uh, and he, he knew um, that there was what I call a geek gap between the Democrats and the Republicans, that these young data scientists were overwhelmingly Democrats. And so he was going to have to center his operation um, out in Salt Lake City um, because there weren't enough in the Boston area where their headquarters were to, to put together a team. But it turned out that he didn't even get the opportunity because he went to a meeting with the Romney High Command and uh, he could tell from the minute he walked in the meeting they were on their Blackberries, their iPhones, they were you know, not paying attention to his proposal to have a big analytics program. So it turned out they were outnumbered five or by some counts ten to one in the number of, of data scientists and, and analytics experts that they had in their campaign. Romney himself wasn't even in the meeting. And it's one of the great mysteries. Here's a guy who pioneered a lot of uh, statistical analysis, um, n not exactly the same kind of analysis, but you know when he was first at Bain Consulting and then Bain Capital, and yet he ran what his own people described as a madman campaign. That was their word. And I have a whole chapter about how they got these guys, not from the 60s, but these Madison Avenue guys from the 80s who had run Reagan's reelection, and they put all their chips on them instead of on, on a 21st century uh, digital uh, campaign. And it's one of the enduring mysteries as to why, uh, why Romney wasn't smarter about it. Um, but it partly reflected some interesting advance thinking. It's easy now to say, but two years ago, a lot of people thought, well, how great is analytics? You know, they didn't see the subprime, that's what uh, Romney's campaign chief strategist, Stuart Stevens, emailed to me at one o'clock in the morning one night. I've got a lot of these emails in my book. He said, well, they didn't see the, the analytics guys didn't see the subprime mortgage crisis coming. You know, why should we have them running our presidential campaign? So there was a, a kind of a skepticism about whether it could be of use that I have to say I shared. It wasn't until after the election when I spent a lot of time with these guys and learned what they had actually done. I was skeptical during the campaign. I kept asking Jim Messina, why are you betting so heavily on these, these tech tools that I know you don't understand, I don't understand. You're putting all your money on this. Tens of millions of dollars, eventually way over a hundred million dollars. Uh, and, you know, they turned out to be right. So, anyway, thank you so much. I look forward to signing any of your books.